There's been much curiosity and concern over how much of the Conjuring movies is real life since the first Conjuring movie was released in 2013. The film, directed by James Wan, grossed $319.5 million at the box office and cost $20 million to make. So was Bathsheba real? And did the Warrens really carry out an exorcism? The answer to the first question is yes, sort of. Not everything in the 2013 hit actually happened, but there were even some events that were too dramatic to be included in the film. After all, real life can be more disturbing than the movies. Here's the truth behind The Conjuring Universe, starting with The Conjuring. All right, it's 918. We're headed down into the cellar where the door's just opened on its own. You give us a sign that you want to communicate with us. Nothing. <laughs> What are you guys? Well, we've been called ghost hunters, paranormal researchers. But we prefer to be known simply as Ed and Lorraine Warren. There's someone here that would like to talk to you. There's something horrible happening in my house. November 1st, 1971, I'm sitting here with Carolyn Perrin, who, with her family, has been experiencing supernatural occurrences. You picking up anything in here, hon? Something awful happened here, Ed. What is it? Whatever Lorraine sees, feels, touches, it takes a toll on her. A little piece each time. You have a lot of spirits in here, but there's one that I'm most worried about because it is so hateful. Here. That's not gonna help. This thing has latched itself to your family. Father, we never seen nothing like this. I'm coming with you. No way. I can't lose you. There's a lady in a dirty nightgown that I see in my dreams. She's standing in front of my mom's bed. <laughs> Yeah. And the music stops. You see him in the mirror standing behind you. Look what she made me do. The Perrons moved into their new 14 bedroom home in Rhode Island in 1971. In the film, their dog Sadie refuses to enter the haunted house before being killed in the garden a few days later. While paranormal activity did take place on the site, it is unlikely that anything this serious took place within the first few days. At first, the family noticed small signs such as the broom going missing and strange scraping sounds against the kettle. The girls, Andrea, Nancy, Christine, Cindy and April, all noticed strange events, but most spirits were harmless. Everything was okay, that is, until they stumbled across Bathsheba. She perceived herself to be the mistress of the house, said the eldest daughter, Andrea Perron, speaking about Bathsheba. It is thought that the witch Bathsheba was a spirit that residents came into contact with. A real-life Satanist, Bathsheba lived in the Rhode Island farmhouse in the mid-1800s. This means that paranormal activity likely began over 100 years before the family moved in.
Peron's daughter, Andrea, spoke of Bathsheba later on. She said, Whoever the spirit was, she perceived herself to be mistress of the house, and she resented the competition my mother posed for that position. In the film, the Satanist was involved in the death of a neighbor's child, but no real-life trial ever took place. You can even go and visit the buried body of Bathsheba Thayer Sherman at Harrisville Cemetery in Rhode Island, where the gravestone suggests that she died in her seventies. In the film, the Warrens, Ed and Lorraine, had a reputation as demonologists after investigating the now-renowned doll, Annabelle. Real-life former police officer, Ed Warren, taught himself the art of demonology while his wife, Lorraine, was a clairvoyant and medium. They worked together on paranormal investigations and ghost hunting across the states. In the 2013 blockbuster, the Warrens moved into the house while the parents stayed at a nearby motel. They carried out an investigation in the house, but in doing so, their daughter Carolyn allegedly became possessed by Bathsheba. Without any time to waste, Ed Warren undertook a successful exorcism on his own daughter. While it is likely the Warrens stayed in the Rhode Island farmhouse, they insist that they did not undertake any exorcisms or seances, as these have to be performed by an approved member of the Catholic Church. Lorraine insists her husband would never perform one, as it has to be done by a Catholic priest. In the film, Lorraine Warren tells her husband that they've gained approval from the church to perform the exorcism. They then leave the haunted site to investigate another case on Long Island. The film does not suggest what the future held for the Perrons, but in real life their exit was more dramatic. Roger Perron kicked the Warrens out of his house after their daughter, Andrea, secretly watched the seance. He was concerned about his wife Carolyn's mental stability too. Andrea, who claimed to have witnessed the seance, said, I thought I was going to pass out. My mother began to speak a language not of this world in a voice not her own. Her chair levitated and she was thrown across the room. As if the Perrons hadn't suffered enough already, they were forced to remain in the haunted house even after the demonologists had left. The Perron family suffered financial instability, so continued to live in the farmhouse until 1980. The family lived in the haunted house for about nine years. It is not known whether the spirits persisted, but it's thought that the family didn't get peace until they moved out. Years later, daughter Andrea wrote a book entitled House of Darkness, House of Light which retold her account of those frightening years in their Rhode Island home. The home itself still stands and has had many new residents, all of whom have had some kind of encounter with the spirits who still reside there. Do you believe this really happened? We would love to hear what you think. Please leave your comments below. Now on to The Conjuring 2. This is my home. Get out of the house. No, this is not your house. Now, what's your name? My name is Bill Wilkins, and I'm 72 years old. What do you make of that voice? Sounds confused. Do you see now? The voice on this tape is coming from an 11-year-old girl. They're calling it England's Amityville. There is a family that desperately needs our help. After everything we've seen, there isn't much that rattles either of us anymore. But this one, this one still haunts me. Does it feel like the voice is coming from inside you? More like it's coming from behind me. Like I'm being used. Janet, are you all right? Stop, Stop calling, calling me Janet. <laughs> She's such a good girl. What's there wrong with her? In a 
oppressing spirit will try to force you to commit the ultimate sin. And what's that? Murder, suicide, or both? You believe us, don't you? Sensing a presence? I'm not sensing anything. All I can sense is their own fear. What is happening? I had a premonition of your death. Who's that? The family's just a pawn. Something inhuman wants to kill you. If we keep doing this... You're going to die. The Conjuring 2 true story reveals that according to the mother, Peggy Hodgson, the haunting of her Enfield home began on the evening of August the 30th 1977. It was on that night that her daughter Janet told her that her brother's beds were wobbling. The next evening Mrs. Hodgson heard a loud noise from upstairs. She entered her children's bedroom and saw a chest of drawers moving. She tried to stop the heavy oak chest as it moved towards the door, concluding that an invisible force was trying to trap them in the room. It started in a back bedroom. The chest of drawers moved and you could hear shuffling, recalled the real Janet Hodgson many years later in a Channel 4 Enfield Poltergeist documentary. Thinking that it was Janet and her siblings making the noise, she said that her mother told them to go to sleep. We told her what was going on and she came to see it for herself. She saw the chest of drawers moving. When she tried to push it back, she couldn't. Knocking would fade in and out as it ran down the wall, supposedly frightening the family so much that they all slept in the same room with the light on. Vic Nottingham, a neighbour, claims that when he went into the home to investigate at the family's request, he heard a knocking on the wall and on the ceiling, leaving him somewhat frightened. The knocking can be heard during this Janet Hodgson interview that was conducted in the home. This is to talk. And that night I went to bed and I can't remember exactly what happened. What, what's that knocking? Yeah, that's, I can hear it now. I was doing that yesterday morning and Peggy was on her own. So she came in to us because you know, it wasn't her, she came in. We sat together and we heard it. And I counted down my knocks and there was 14 altogether. And it's doing it again now. Here are some questions we have been asked by viewers. Did dozens of crosses turn upside down? No. In fact, checking The Conjuring 2 by comparing it to the real Enfield Poltergeist case, we found no evidence that crosses turned upside down on the walls of the Hodgson home. In fact, the upside down cross has not traditionally been a symbol of evil. It is the cross of St. Peter who was crucified upside down because he felt that he was not worthy to be crucified in the same way as Jesus. Did the mother, Peggy, go to the neighbor's house for help? Yes. While exploring the Conjuring 2 true story, we learned that single mother, Peggy Hodgson, took the family next door and pleaded for help. The neighbours, Vic and Peggy Nottingham, offered to go into the home to investigate. I went in there and I couldn't make out these noises. There was a knocking on the wall, in the bedroom, on the ceiling, said Vic. I was beginning to get a bit frightened. Did Janet Hodgson really levitate? In the movie, Peggy's daughter, Janet, Madison Wolf, rises high into the air and finds herself pinned against the ceiling. 
This is a complete exaggeration of what allegedly happened in real life during the Enfield haunting. Photographs of the real Janet Hodgson levitating only show her a short distance above her bed. This, coupled with the way her body is positioned in the air, has led many people to believe that she simply jumped from her bed. The questionable photographs were taken by Daily Mirror photographer Graham Morris after the family contacted the press. It should be noted that the Daily Mirror is a UK tabloid newspaper whose stories have often proven less than credible. The levitation was scary, recalled Janet, because you didn't know where you were going to land. Supporting the family's claims were two witnesses, a baker and a lollipop lady, who were passing by outside and claimed to have seen Janet hovering above her bed as they looked through an upstairs window. The lady saw me spinning around and banging against the windows, recalls Janet. I thought I might actually break the window and go through it. Did demonologists Ed and Lorraine Warren really investigate the Enfield poltergeist case? Yes, but to a far lesser degree than portrayed in the movie, which is somewhat misleadingly billed as being based on the true case files of the Warrens. Paranormal researchers Ed and Lorraine Warren briefly investigated the Enfield poltergeist in the summer of 1978 and were just two of the many investigators to visit the Hodgson's North London home on Green Street. Most articles about the Enfield poltergeist case don't even mention the Warrens, leading one to conclude that their role in the case was significantly dramatised for The Conjuring 2. In fact, Guy Lyon Playfair, one of the original paranormal investigators on the Enfield poltergeist case, came forward prior to the movie's release and said that the warrants had showed up uninvited and only stayed for a day. He also said that Ed Warren told him he could make him a lot of money off of the case. Ed Warren touched on the case and its skeptics in Gerald Brittle's book, The Demonologist, stating, Inhuman spirit phenomena were in progress. Now, you couldn't record the dangerous, threatening atmosphere inside that little house, but you could film the levitations, teleportations and dematerializations of people and objects that were happening there. Not to mention the many hundreds of hours of tape recordings made of these spirit voices speaking out loud in the rooms. As the case became widely viewed as a hoax, some saw it as proof that the Warrens themselves were frauds. Was 11-year-old Janet Hodgson really possessed by a dead man named Bill Wilkins? We discovered that this part of the movie was to some degree inspired by audio tapes of the real Janet Hodgson. In the recordings, she can be heard conveying a message via an eerie voice, which is supposedly that of Bill Wilkins, a man who had died in the living room of the house several years earlier. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Margaret's just sleeping on top of you. Margaret's just sleeping on top of you. Margaret's just sleeping on top of you. You could growl. You could growl and sleep. You could bark and all the sleep and you could talk to yourself. Janet, Margaret and Betty are all just sledding me talking. I will. Just before I died, I went blind, said the voice. And then I had a hemorrhage and I fell asleep and I died in the chair in the corner downstairs. An interview with Janet Hodgson at the time suggests that the idea of talking in a possessed voice may have been encouraged and planted in Janet's mind by paranormal investigator Maurice Gross. When asked when the voices started, Janet said that one night Maurice Gross told them all we need now is the voices to talk. Almost immediately following the suggestion, they did. What about the voices? When when did the voices start? December the 12th. December the 12th? Yes. And how did they start? Well, 
one night, Mr. Grove was talking about it, about eight thirty. He said, "All we need now is a voices to talk." And that night, I went to bed, and I can't remember exactly what happened. The voices had mainly growled, barked, and made similar noises prior to this. I felt used by a force that nobody understands. The real Janet Hodgson told the UK's Channel 4 years later. I really don't like to think about it too much. I'm not sure the poltergeist was truly evil. It was almost as if it wanted to be part of our family. It didn't want to hurt us. It had died there and wanted to be at rest. The only way it could communicate was through me and my sister. Did the man who allegedly possessed Janet die in the downstairs living room years earlier? Yes, in exploring the Enfield haunting, we learned that Bill Wilkins' son Terry confirmed that he had died in a manner similar to what Janet described when she was possessed. Wilkins had passed away in an armchair downstairs after suffering a brain hemorrhage. Did the paranormal activity begin after they played with the Ouija board? Yes, at least according to the real Janet Hodgson, who says that she and her sister, Margaret, played with the Ouija board just prior to the start of the supernatural activity. Did furniture really move? Perhaps the most credible claim of furniture moving in the Hodgson home at 284 Green Street involved a policewoman, WPC Carolyn Heaps, who signed an affidavit to the effect that she had witnessed an armchair levitate approximately half an inch and move close to four feet across the floor. It um, came off the floor, or nearly a half inch, I should say, and I saw it slide off to the right, about three and a half to four feet, before it came to rest. Um, I checked to see whether or not it could possibly have slid along the floor. I placed a marble on the floor to see whether or not the marble would um, go in the same direction as the chair did, and it didn't, it didn't roll at all. Um, I checked for wires under the cushion of the chair, and I could find no explanation at all. In all, there were more than 30 witnesses to similar strange incidents in the home. In addition to furniture moving, they had supposedly witnessed objects flying around, cold breezes, physical assaults, pools of water appearing on the floor, graffiti, and perhaps most incredibly, matches spontaneously igniting. What caused the Enfield poltergeist events to quieten down? The real Janet Hodgson believes that it was a priest's 1978 visit to the family's Enfield home in North London that caused the hauntings to calm down, not the Warrens, though the occurrences did not end completely. Peggy still hears noises in the house from time to time, and Janet's younger brother Billy, who lived there until his mother passed, remarked that you always felt like you were being watched. Is it possible that the whole thing was a hoax? Yes, two experts from the Society for Psychical Research SPR, caught the children bending spoons themselves. They also found it strange why no one was allowed in the room when Janet was talking in her possessed voice, which was supposedly that of Bill Wilkins, among others. Janet herself admitted that some of the Enfield haunting events were fabricated. In 1980, she told ITV News, Oh yeah, once or twice we faked things, just to see if Mr. Gross and Mr. Playfair could catch us. They always did. In an article that was published in the year before the release of The Conjuring 2, Janet said that roughly 2% of the paranormal activity in their Green Street home had been faked. During a Margaret and Janet Hodgson interview that aired as part of a TV special in 1980, Janet is asked how it feels to be haunted by a poltergeist. It's not haunted, Janet replies smiling. Her sister smiles in astonishment, as if Janet just gave up a secret, and whispers, Shut up! through muted giggles. Janet later said she didn't feel that the poltergeist was evil, meaning that the house wasn't necessarily haunted. Like the Enfield poltergeist story, a slew of similar accounts emerged in the years following the 1973 release of The Exorcist. Some argue that the film gave birth to a culture of paranormal hoaxes carried out by those seeking money and fame. 
Others believe that the William Friedkin film allowed impressionable minds to become easily influenced by its demonic plot. In any case, similar alleged true stories emerged, such as the ones chronicled in the Amityville Horror, The Exorcism of Emily Rose, the original Conjuring and its spin-offs. What do you really believe happened? Leave your comments below. Now on to the latest movie of the Conjuring universe, The Nun. I had a series of visions when I was younger. And after each one ended, the same thought would be stuck in my head. What did you see? I saw a nun. Word of my visions reached the church. And I was asked to accompany a priest to an abbey in Romania. The abbey has a long history. Valak. Not all good. What? She knew him down. Callahan's here. If you know anything about the real-life Enfield investigation, you'll know that the movie adaptation of the famous case took quite a few liberties, the most obvious one being our introduction to the demon Valak. Well, it turns out that Valak is in fact a real demon, one that the creators of the Conjuring franchise have added into the mix as a way to link both the Enfield and Amityville stories together. While it's true that the Warrens did investigate Amityville, and it's also true that they did spend a few days meeting the actual investigators of the Enfield poltergeist, as far as we know, neither of these cases have anything to do with Valak in real life. So who exactly was this demon, and why were they dressed like a nun? According to the Demon Conjurer's go-to guide, the Lesser Key of Solomon, a 17th century grimoire that acts as a kind of yellow pages of hell, Valak, or Ualak, Valak, Valax, Valu, Valik, Volak, is none other than the great president of hell. Often depicted as riding a two-headed dragon and commanding 30 legions of demons, he takes on the visage of a small child with wings, which if you ask me, would have been way more terrifying than a nun in corpse paint. Valak's skill set also amounts to a lot more than floating Legos around the room and spinning crosses. Even today, he's often invoked by magical practitioners who are looking to find true answers of hidden treasures. He's also known as being quite strong and not opposed to sharing that strength with those worthy of calling upon him. Not worthy? Well then, I'd hate to be you because Valak will probably ruin your life which happens a lot slower than it does in the movies. So what did Valak have to do with Amityville, Enfield and the Warrens? Nothing. James Wan, the film's director, says he intended the demon to be a premonition for the Enfield poltergeist case, with no relation to the paranormal activity happening in 112 Ocean Avenue. She's got nothing to do with Amityville at all, he told reporters. Most likely, the demon was introduced as a wholly original way for The Conjuring to bridge the Amityville and Enfield cases together in a semi-cohesive way, as the rights to the Amityville horror are owned by another company, making any popularized connection to Jay Anson's book or their horror films based on it a no-go. But the biggest question of all, why is Valak presented to us as a late 90s representation of Marilyn Manson? You can thank James Wan and the real-life Lorraine Warren for that. 
While the name of the Big Bad had been decided upon early in the process, Wan still hadn't settled upon the actual design of the demon until the 11th hour. While speaking to Lorraine in passing one day, she mentioned that she'd once encountered a swirling vortex with a dark hooded figure at the centre. That bit of information was translated into the demonic nun, which, believe it or not, was added to the story in a series of reshoots. I had a strong outlook on the whole movie, but the one thing I wasn't quite sure of was the design of the demon character, James Wan explained. I felt like I was still discovering it, and believe it or not, I always knew that I was going to do additional photography. So I was saving it because I was hoping I'd discover what that thing would look like as I was putting the movie together in post-production. Here's hoping that if Falak makes an appearance in future films, they'll ditch the nun and give us some nightmares of winged children from hell instead. The demon in the movie shares little with the demon of mythology other than the use of snakes and the title Marquis of Snakes. What do you think? If you've enjoyed our video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos.